him and leave it there. I was down with no way up, and I needed some help. Everybody breathing but not living, just existing. Well, and I needed some help. Somebody told me that Jesus will set you free. I tried it for myself and now I know what he did for me. Good morning, good morning, and I bring you greetings in the precious name of our Savior Jesus Christ. Wake up, wake up, wake up. God has given us another day. This is the day the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad. Uh, the Lord has been good. That's just a statement of fact. I'll say it again while you're getting ready and letting some folk know as they're coming on. I want to thank you for joining us this morning by way of our virtual broadcast. Please inform other folks about the broadcast. You ought to share the good news and allow us to continue to evangelize the Word of God. But anyway, I just thank you for coming out, and today God has a word. There is a word from the Lord. We're in our third week of Advent, and in preaching this third week of Advent, um, there is uh, so many, so many Christmas stories. I've been doing this series dealing with the principles that come out of all of the situations around the birth of Christ. There are some excellent biblical foundations that come out of the preaching of these texts. I know you think you've heard these texts time and time again, but every time I go in, I am amazed at the goodness of God. Will you join me in a word of prayer? Join me in a word of prayer. Father God, bless all those who are listening today. As they have gotten up this morning, I don't know what's on their mind. We know that this time of year can be heavy for some folk. It can be a time of darkness for some folk, even with all the Christmas cheer. But I ask them to continually remember when light gets dark, you are the light of the world. And Lord, I need you to get into their lives right now. Tell them you are a God of fresh starts and new beginnings. And you are a God that can take us to a place of rejoicing and rejuvenation and restoration. Lord, you do all of those things well. That's why we made it this far. So somebody right now asks that you would put an expectation in their spirit, that they would know the word that's about to go forth is going to be just for them. I thank you right now, God. I give you all the glory and honor, Lord, and allow me not to get in the way of you. In Jesus' name, amen. This text that I'm about to read has been um, tailored to teach us some very principled positions from God. So go with me to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, and I want you to look at verse 8 when you get to Luke chapter 2. I'm going to be reading uh, from the American Standard Version, but I want you to kind of navigate your way to the 8th verse, and we'll read several verses in your hearing. Watch the freshness of what God is trying to say. And there were shepherds in the same country abiding in the field and keeping watch by night over their flock. And an angel of the Lord stood by them and the glory of, of God shone around them and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Be not afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all the people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David, a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this is the sign unto you. You shall find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was an angel and a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men in whom he is well pleased. And it came to pass when the angel went away, from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known unto us. And it came to pass, they found both Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. And when they saw it, they made known concerning the saying which was spoken to them about this child. 
and all that heard it wondered at the things which were spoken unto them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things, all these sayings, and pondered them in her heart. For as long as the Spirit of God will allow us this morning, get ready for this. We're going to talk about the power of Christmas peace. The power of Christmas peace. I'm going to ask you a question to start this sermon off. And it's a personal question, but it is not a question that I want you to answer out loud anyway. But at least I want you to think about it and answer it to yourself. Here it is. Have you ever... Or do you know anyone suffering from mental illness? Well, what I'm saying is, do you know anybody that is suffering from mental illness? What do I mean by mental illness? Well, Dr. Jeffrey Liberman, in his recent TED Talk, talked about the kind of Illnesses we're talking about, those that we all know about, and that would be uh, anxiety disorders, OCDC, schizophrenia, depression, uh, when you talk about addictions, addicted to drugs and alcohol, any of those diseases that we hear and see, uh, chronic diseases that a lot of people are going through, bipolar disorder, all of those things. And when we hear this, we want to say that we don't have these kind of things happening to us, but mental illness is anything that messes with your cognition, your, your cognition of your thoughts, your perspective about things. It's something that has to deal with your emotional control. Just to tell you how prevalent mental illness is. The National Institute on Mental Health says that there is at least 20% of the world is suffering from some sort of mental illness. That is one in every five people have a mental illness or at some time in their life will wrestle with a mental illness. That's one billion people worldwide and that's at least 70 million Americans that go through or have to wrestle with some sort of mental illness. Now you wonder why we live in a world as, uh, I want to say crazy, which is not a word to say, but some of the stuff that goes on, we just have to shake your head and wonder what are people thinking about. But you need to know that there is something going on where the sin nature has risen up. There's something going on where the world has lost some of its morality. There's something going on where the world is screaming out for some peace and some help. They're screaming out for someone to help them. And they find themselves right in the middle of mental illnesses. Do you know, as somebody might say, well, Pastor, that's not me. Yeah, but did you know that stress leads to stress and pressures of daily living lead to mental illness. Now, all of us have to deal with stress. There are there's some stressors that actually lead to mental illness that they're, they're in the order. Let me give you the top stressors to see how somebody can get to a point where they would have to deal with some mental illness because they have to deal with those stressors. The first one is the loss of a spouse or a child. That's the number one reason that can have a person go off in an area and they never rebound again uh, in their thinking capacity because they're dealing with the stress of that and it can lead to some sort of prolonged mental illness. Marital or divorce is number two. Divorce is a number, another, another stressor that takes people a long time to get over. Marital separation is another one that takes people a long time to get over. Being in prison is another one of the top stressors that people need to get over. Having the loss of a close relative is another stressor that can lead you to the place where you're wrestling with mental illness. And also, um, there is... Um, I said in prison, but there's another one that I thought was kind of crazy when I looked at the number of it on the list, and that is marriage. Just being married can cause stress in your life that can lead to some mental illness. Somebody said, oh, that's what's going on. Huh? And then not only that, you have to worry about 
losing a job. There's other things. All of these things you have to deal with. Now, professional people have given a name to these kind of stresses when people can't get over them. They're called the worried well. You're well, but you worry all the time. Or the chronic stressors. People who go around constantly stressed out. This will lead you to a place where you can't function. All of these numbers, all this information is telling you we're living in a world where people need to get some peace. They need inner peace. They need peace of mind. They need to do something. Right now they're crying out and they're getting therapy and they're getting medication and please know that I advocate therapy and I advocate medication and I say take your medication but what about after you take the medication and after you go through the therapy, therapy you're still worried. I want to tell you about something this morning. I have some great news as I'm coming to you during this Christmas season. Something that will shake off this doldrums, that will shake off this stuff you're going through. Please listen to me. Anybody going through and don't know how you're going to make it through this Christmas, let me give you the great news of this text. God has peace. This statement that I just said, God has peace. I know I got a witness out there. This statement can be backed up by many people that can testify that God is the only reason that I was able to remain stable in any situation. And it was the peace of God in my life that blessed me. God has peace. And when God brings this peace into our life, it's a peace that brings us something that we don't even understand. What I'm trying to tell you is that you can try everything else in the world, but there is a supernatural peace of God that can hold you through any situation. Yep, I'm talking to you. I don't know what's going on in your life, but I'm telling you right now that if you would trust God, and you will believe God. God can calm your nights and calm your days. And God can get you to a place through this Christmas season that he can bless you. Here's why this message is called the power in Christmas peace. Because peace came. God sent peace at Christmas. But the peace was not just for Christmas. The peace was sent here to stay. Now I'm not talking about chronological Christmas. I'm not talking about a date when you want to argue about December 25th or whatever you want to argue about. I'm not talking about that. I am talking about a redemptive Christmas, the redemptive plan of God, a Savior being born. I'm talking about the salvific plan of God, salvation coming into the world. I'm talking about the uh, resurrected plan of God, power coming into the world. Because when the Savior came, he brought peace. And that's what the key verse in our text tells us. If you look at verse 14, in this text of chapter 2, you'll find out 13 and 14 says, And suddenly there was an angel, there was with the angel, a heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. This peace came. One of the first things God brought when he was about to have the birth of the Savior, the plan of God, somebody ought to get this, the plan of God was that peace would come. God has peace. You need to get the peace that God has. There is no child of God, hear me again, that should be walking around without the peace of God. Yet yeah, all of us have to wrestle. I just told you the mental health statistics. Statistics. All of us have to go through, but there should be no child of God. If you're telling me I'm about to give up, give up when you got a God on your side. Why are you worried when there's a God who has already picked you up out of some situations and now is ready to take you further in your life? Don't you dare stop. What you need to find is and understand is the first thing the angel said to the shepherd was peace on earth, goodwill to men. That means God knows you need peace. That means God has supplied the peace. That means you just have to get the peace. Are you interested? I'm going to tell you today how to break some chains and how to make sure you don't get yourself caught up in something that leads to you missing what God has for you, missing the real life you have, missing the blessings of God, not able to stay committed or focused to the life and don't even like the life you have because you don't understand that Christmas peace, that peace that came when the Savior came down from glory is a peace that has power to stabilize our world. Why is Christmas peace so powerful? Just listen to the word of God. It lets you know that first of all, that peace is powerful because it's a supernatural peace. Philippians chapter 4 verse 6 and 7 says, be anxious for nothing but in all things by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of who? The peace of what? The peace of God which passive understanding 
understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. It's going to keep your heart. It's going to keep your mind. Do you realize that most of your Christian journey is going to be fought in spiritual warfare? It's going to be fought in your mind. It's going to be attacks that come against your thinking processes and your thoughts. Some of us can't even get through a day because the enemy has us all bogged down. And you need to know how serious it is. Just like a physical illness, when a mental illness grabs a hold of you and starts stealing your life, all because you won't turn it over to God. How many know there's a God out there who can take your life and put it back on track? Wake somebody up. Tell them to hear this today. God said, yes, I'm not telling you not to take your medication. I'm not saying that mental health is not something that is very, uh, uh, what I would say, sophisticated or there's really reasons for happening here. There's reasons that happen in our bodies. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a supernatural peace from God even while you're going through the trouble. God can give you supernatural peace. Look what he said. He said, all you have to do is wait on me, thank me, and then I will give you a peace, that passive understanding. This peace is so powerful because it works when we're overwhelmed. St. John chapter 16 verse 33 tells us very clearly our Savior came and he was letting us know these things, what things? His teachings that he taught us. He said these teachings, uh, these things I've spoken unto you so that in this world you shall have tribulation but be of good cheer. I've already overcome the world. These things have I spoken unto you that you might have peace. Because in this world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've already overcome the world. God said, even when you're overcome, even when you're in tribulation, even when it looks like you can't make it, God said, I gave you a peace. Not only is it supernatural, not only is it powerful because it's supernatural, not only is it powerful because God tells us, right, that he gave this peace to us for those overwhelming moments, it's also powerful because it's perfect. Isaiah 26 and 3 tells us, and this is something. This is what the word of God says. It is a perfect peace. He said, I will keep him. God didn't just say give him. He said, I'll keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on me. God said, right now, what you got to do is check those thoughts. Get your mind right. Get it back in order. And God said, I will give you a peace when you keep your mind. I don't care how overwhelming your circumstances, this peace can keep you when you're going through. And lastly, it's supernatural because God left it for us. St. John 14, 27. He said, uh, I give you peace. My peace I give unto you, not as the world gives unto you. Did you hear what God said? I don't give you what the world gives you. He said, but I give you my peace. My peace have I given unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither be afraid. You believe in God, believe in me. Here's what he said. Don't let your heart be troubled. I have peace for you. Can somebody understand this morning that God's peace not only is powerful because of what God has left us, but in this text, God is going to show you. I'm going to show you. If you're glad you're tuned in, because I'm going to show you how to deal with the anxious moments of your life. I know. Because of the stigma, you don't want to tell anybody, but you need to get well. You need to know that God did not save you to walk around always silently suffering, always wondering why I worry all the time, always wondering why I can't ever get any peace. This text will show you how. There are three principles in this text that is brought out when God brought peace at Christmas through these shepherds. That's right. I'm excited. That's why I'm moving on this so you can hear me. There are three things in this text you need to know. God's peace is powerful, number one, because of his providential plan for the world and for each one of us, but his providential plan for your life. Let's look at this first point, God's providential plan. You need to know that Luke's gospel is written by a historian, by a very educated man. Luke was not like John in Matthew and Mark. He was a companion of Paul. He wrote as a historian and not as an eyewitness. That's very important because he wanted us to know that the 
facts I'm writing down coincide with history so you can depend on that I've researched it, I've looked at it, I've been meticulous with it, I've been careful with it. So when you hear this word, you need to know it's not something that's fly by night. I wrote this so you would know. If you go to the first part of Luke's gospel, you'll see that he's talking to Theopolis saying why he wrote this gospel. He wanted to set down in order because he was talking to Gentiles. You and me, he wanted to set down in order the things that God has done because Luke presents Jesus Christ as a Savior for all men, right? He's a Savior for everybody. That's the first point that should keep peace in your life is the fact that God is a Savior, that you have, listen to that word, you have a Savior. You have someone who has been sent particularly, who died particularly just to save you. What in the world are you doing? Your lack of peace does not make sense when you compare it to what Jesus said he already left you and what he has done for you. What you got to realize, though, is recognize I have a Savior. That should make somebody shout. That means no matter what I go through, I have someone I can turn to who has all power in his hand, who is, if you hear this, who has already defeated death, hell, and the grave, who already walked in my shoes, who know what it means to be bombarded by demonic forces, who knows what it means when your flesh wants to get out of control, who knows what it means when the world is telling you what's right and what's wrong, and you're battling against the lies and deceit of the world, and yet God said, in the middle of all that, I can give you peace if you understand how to walk in my word. Understand that Christmas peace, it came for a redemptive person. This is not, We got to quit looking at peace as this nice little thing. I just need some peace. No, peace is precious and it's powerful and there's a whole lot of folk fighting and wishing that they had some peace. Peace. So you got to first say, I have a Savior. What am I talking about? You got to get away from this rah-rah gospel. Uh, you want to look at the gospel all the time, and you want people to preach to you about your self-esteem. You want someone to preach to you about how to get your wallet better. You want someone to teach you how to walk in this world better. Well, that's not the kind of peace. That's not when God gives you peace. The Bible speaks of peace in three ways. He talks about spiritual peace which is the first piece, and that is you have to first get a peace with God. And then he talks about psychological peace. That's that inner peace. All we ever think about is the inner peace, the psychological peace. But God said, until you tap into me, there'll never be a steady flow of psychological peace. And then he said, not only that, there is relational peace. You can't live this Christian life and not have peace with your fellow man. You can't be walking around out of kilter with everybody, no relationship, and think you're going to have peace. There is spiritual peace with God, the most important. It says we receive peace with God through our Savior, Jesus Christ. That means God no longer looks at our sin. That's the first step to real peace. And then we have to go with that uh, relational peace and we have to make sure we get that inner peace from God. So God is telling us we can do that but you got to learn to celebrate me as Savior and understand you signed up. Listen to me. You signed up. Somebody said, what are you talking about? You signed up for hard times. You never read anywhere in your Bible what you're running around whining about, what you're getting upset about. You never read anywhere in your Bible. None of the Bible cat, none of the Bible patriarchs, nobody who got a miracle. I don't know where we got the idea. Here's what we never read, that everything in their life went well. No, it told you to stand in faith, even though things are not going the way you want to go. But you need to learn that you need to be prepared to fight. That's what you signed up for. Come on, wake up. Get up this morning. You're watching me now because God wants you to fight. God's saying, fight out of that funk. Fight out of that stuff you're going through. Quit acting like this is the end. And quit separating your days from God's deliverance. Meaning, you one day you feel good, the next day you don't feel good. God said, that's not my peace. you got to make sure you're prepared to fight. Job said, a man that is born of a woman is of a few days and full of Trouble, meaning that a man can't make it, that there's going to be trouble in our life, all of us, somewhere along the line, through these few days that we are living. The Bible tells us in Corinthians, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Steadfast, unmovable. You know the problem with some saints? You have never, ever stood past your point of pain. Soon as something starts hurting soon as something starts. Instead of you turning to God, letting God kick your faith into another gear, you turn back and retreat back 
to that same whining and that same defeatist attitude, you speak back to that place where God can't help you because you're not acting like and building your own attitude up to know that God can bless you. You. So you got to understand that God is telling us that we have to be prepared to fight. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. you got to learn how to stay committed. you got to learn how to stay tough. I wish I could give you a message that says you can just float through life, but I would be giving you a disservice. you got to learn all of us. Come on. Where are the folks that say, I had to try to hold on to my mind. Where are the people that know there's some days when I... See, when you see some of us that you think we're making it, that's because we learn how to hold on through those dark times. Can I get an amen? If we, we learn how to... Uh, when, we're, when we're going through stuff, you would not know it because I just believe that what I signed up for is I'm going to get some demonic attacks and they're going to attack me in my mind, but I'm going to have to cast down those imaginations. I just believe that at the end of the day, I am going to win. But you got to learn that it may not be good, but as long as you hold on to God, it's going to be awesome. What do I mean by that? You know, you know, you know the uh, uh, pleasure in paying bills is not paying bills. It's having the money to pay the bill. And so I still, if I had money to pay the bill, I still don't like bills, but I can deal with the bill because I got the money to pay the bill. Right? So I don't walk around now just because I got the money to pay the bill singing, I love bills, I love bills. I don't do that because that would be crazy. But I do thank God I got the money to pay. You know the pleasure in owning a house is surely not the mortgage. It's not trying to keep the maintenance up. It's not trying to keep the grass cut. It's not trying to keep appliances from breaking down. It's not trying to keep the air conditioning and the heater from going off. No, the pleasure is after I do all that, I may not like it, but when I can go in on a snowy day and got somewhere to lay my head and I can warm up and in front of my heater in my house, all that other stuff is worth it. So I'll go through all that stuff just to make sure I can get to that point. Why can't we see it's the same way with God? Just, I don't have to like trials. No, every trial you go through, every tribulation you go through, every struggle you go through, don't like it, but you ought to say, but I got a God who I know I can depend on. Think about it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego standing there, getting ready to get thrown into the fire. They weren't happy about the fire, but they wouldn't bow. You know what they thought about? You won't bow, will you? you know what they thought about? They said, when I get in the fire, there'll be somebody in the fire with me. And it came to pass. Look at verse 2. In those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And the taxing was first with Cyrenius, the governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone in his own city. And then it talks about Joseph going from Galilee, from Nazareth, into Bethlehem. In, because that is where the baby, that's where it was prophesied that Jesus was to be born. What we're looking at now is God's providence. I want you to see the language of the first verse. And it, and it came to pass in those days. These are days that God owned. All I want you to shout about is that if God in his providence, providence just means something has already been laid out to work in your favor. God has said, my job is uh, I have a providential plan over your life. It's already laid out to work in your favor. So what God is saying is that I am going to make sure that you be okay because I've already laid a path for you to be okay. So the language says, and it will come to pass. That's why God tells us to keep going. I don't know what you're waiting on, but I dare you to say to yourself, it will come to pass. I dare to say to yourself right now, I know my God is going to make it. What I'm telling you is that you have to go through some things, but you ought to know that it's not your plan. Well, I want that point to seek in. God's providential plan is not your plan. It's God's plan. What am I saying? This text is talking about Caesar Augustus, the head of the Roman Empire, an evil ruler, now putting in a tax, a census, a registration that made everyone go back to where they were so the Roman Empire, which was massive, could get a, get a census of their citizens and also get the most out of their taxes. So in the process of this, it meant that Joseph had to go back to Bethlehem. And the Bible says in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, that the baby, let me read the text to you, it says, But thou, O Bethlehem of Ephrathah, Thou 
through a little, you are a little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, and that is to be a ruler in Israel, whose going forth has been from the old and from the everlasting. You ought to shout, the devil thinks he's doing something evil, and God takes the evil and turns it around for your good. The first thing you need to understand about providence is that God uses the trouble in your life to get you closer to him. But you got to understand God's providential nature meant he used an evil ruler. And usually when the man went back to the city, the wife didn't have to go, but Mary had to travel because she was so far gone in her pregnancy. So, so he made sure Mary and Jesus that was going to be born was there with them. And then he made sure that there was no room in the inn so the baby could be born lowly. Like, did you hear what I'm saying? God got a plan all worked out. I need somebody right now to understand that while you're trying to figure something out, you need to know that God's providence in your life already has a plan for your life, and you just got to trust in the providence of God. When you trust in the providence of God, you know that he's faithful. And when God is faithful, it means I will make it out. Remember when David... King David was actually ordained or anointed to be king. Think about what he went through before he became king. He killed a lot. He had some highs. If I was saying about his, you know, his prowess as a military man, he was well accepted. But then he had to go through Saul's jealousy, Saul chasing him. David ended up in case. See, you, you look at life, you want to look at it in a straight line. No, life goes to ups, down, sideways, but the one constant is I got a providential plan on my life. And the only reason, who up here tell somebody something? The only reason right now, if you would stop worrying about things going on in your life right now, think about how God got you out before. Think about how God's hand. There's some areas in your life right now that you don't know how you got up out of without the hand of God being on you. So God is faithful. He used Cyrenius and he used Augustus and he used this plan to bring to pass the prophecy that Bethlehem would be the birth of the Savior. How many more times has God knocked the enemy out of your life to bless you? So what God does is he uses the trouble, if we understand the trouble, so that he can take us to a place to bless us. What do I mean? In Matthew chapter 4, as soon as Jesus got baptized, raised the sign in, the first thing that happened to Jesus was, watch this, uh, he had to go into the wilderness. And the devil came to him and said, turn the rocks to bread. Jesus said, no, it's written. Man shall live only by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Deuteronomy 8 and 3. Then he told Jesus, he said, uh, I want you to jump off here. And he said, no, I shouldn't tempt the Lord my God. And then he said, look, I'm going to show you all of these uh, all of these kingdoms of the world just bow down to me. And Jesus again quoted Deuteronomy 6.13. He quoted Deuteronomy 6.16. The trouble in your life should bring you closer to the word because God used the trouble to bless you. Dan Rowan. Just because you're saved don't mean you understand what I'm saying. Dan Rowan committed suicide on December 2nd by a self-inflicted gunshot wound. He was from Florida. He was in Mississippi on trial. Oh, I forgot to tell you, Dan Rowan is Pastor Dan Rowan. It seems that he had been going in Tennessee to preach a revival, and the sin nature in his life got the best of him, and he saw these two girls that he picked up under the pretense that he was going to take them to get some hamburgers and some milkshakes, and he got them in a motel and raped them. Charges were filed subsequently. This was 2018. He's been going through the trial system, the justice system, and Telling his congregation how innocent he was. He never repented. His sin nature got the best of him. And then, through all the mental anguish, he shot and killed himself. I do want you to know, parenthetically, that suicide has risen 24% over the, since 1994. 1999, suicide has risen over 24% and is definitely going through the younger generations. But I need you to know, God, here's what I'm telling you about the peace of God. If Dan would have held on to the peace of God, God still would have got him out. God still would have blessed him. Now, I'm not saying Dan did not deserve to go to jail. But I'm saying God will even keep... The, okay, okay, I got to explain this. Providence is not God stopping stuff from happening to you. That's what's wrong with you now. Providence is not God showing up in the nick of time and getting you out. Providence is not God... Show, that's, why, that's why you cry. Why did this happen? Why did happen? That's not providence. Providence is when God keeps you even though the stuff happens. You ought to know God's providence on me. Point. Second point 
the message, not only God's providential plan, God's pursuit and our provisions. Here's the main part of our text. And there were shepherds. It's where we started, living out in the field. You need to understand something, first of all. Shepherds had hearts for their sheep. Shepherds were faithful to their jobs, but shepherds were the lowly people that were born. There were shepherds in a nearby field, and the angels, watch God, the angels and God showed up to the shepherds. He didn't show up to kings, he didn't show up to aristocrats, he showed up to the shepherds. And the Bible says the shepherds were afraid when God showed up, and the first thing God said is, Fear not, don't be fearful, until you be born this day, the Savior of David, the Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And he said, There'll be peace on earth, goodwill to men. Why did God come to the shepherds? Well, I want to tell you this. God's providential plan also adds that his pursuit of us. God is always pursuing us. Don't ever think you're the one. God chose you. You did not choose him. Come on, understand this. And so if we go back to Luke 2.14 and read it in the NIV, listen to what the 14th verse says. Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those whom his favor rests. So the translation is, not peace on earth, goodwill to men, but peace on those whom his favor rests. That's part of his providence. He's pursuing those who he wants to put favor in their life. God always goes after the marginal lies, the hurting. He goes after people who wouldn't have made it without him. I got a theory that's backed up scripturally that God comes after those of us who need him the most, and he knows we won't make it, but he also knows we will love him the most because of the pain and situation in our lives. But you got to remember that it was God who chose you. John 5. 16, 15, 16, excuse me, says, I, you did not choose me. I chose you. And I chose you that you might have fruit, that your life may be fruitful. God said, my favor in your life is, no matter what you think, your life will turn out all right. Somebody ought to thank God right there. That's why it's turned out now. No matter how much you go through, it's going to turn out all right. God said, I chose you, and you didn't choose me. When we look at the text, Ephesians 1 and 4 said, He chose us before the creation of the world that we might be holy and blameless in His sight. He already had it planned. He pursued you. And then First Peter said, We're a royal generation, a holy nation. God said, chosen to give praises to those who has taken us out of darkness into the marvelous light. God said, I give you favor. Right now I'm telling somebody, please Peace should come in your life because God is pursuing you and because God is giving you favor and because God loves you and because we need to realize we had nothing to do with it and that's why we should shudder because God is the one who worked this plan. There was a little girl, I like this illustration, who had a doll collection and people would come by, she, all the dolls be sitting there and people would say, wow, this girl has a great doll collection. And one visitor came in and said, out of all these dolls, which one do you love the most? I told this story, but you need to understand this because it gets me every time. And he said, girl said, I'll show you. And she ran upstairs and brought back the raggediest looking doll you ever seen. Goodwill wouldn't even take it. Eye popped out. Hair hanging by one strand. Fingers missing off the hand. Uh, the neck was a little tilted. One of the feet were missing. And the lady said, with all of these dolls, why do you like that one? And she said, this is the one that needs me the most. I love her. That's what God's saying to you. Quit worrying. I chose you because I know you needed me. And I love you and you don't have to worry about what somebody else is doing. The real point in your life is understanding that God gave the shepherds he showed, he showed them, I'm going to give you favor. He comes to shepherd. He comes to those who need him. And as long as you have God's peace in your life, it trumps any other problems going on in your life. Can I tell you this? There's a true story about a young lady who mother was a prostitute, and she was one of the mistakes of her mother's occupation. She never knew who her father was. But her plan in life got her to a place where she was living a Christian life, had a husband who loved the Lord, beautiful children, beautiful house, nice income. But something was pushing on her because she had this obsession with trying to figure out, who is my father? It was a hole. She, she didn't feel, she never could get any peace about her situation. And it started to affect her family. It started to affect her job. It started to affect her marriage. She said, and one day standing to the sink washing dishes as tears were running down my face, she said, I couldn't help it. I just cried out. I said, God, 
Who is my father? I can't live like this. Tell me. And she said she heard a voice that said, I'm your father. She said the voice was so startling that she looked around to see if anybody had come into the kitchen and nobody had come in. And she said she heard it again. But this time the voice said, I'm your father. I always have been. I chose you. She said all of a sudden her heart broke. She knew that God's purpose and eternal plan was working. She no longer had to worry about who her real father was. She got some internal peace. Can I ask you this before I go to my last point? What are you worried about? God's peace trumps whatever you're saying is going on in your life. The Bible tells us that after the angels left, verse 15 came to pass when the angels were gone. These shepherds said, let us go and see this great thing. The third point, our proclamation and progress. First point in this text says, peace of God comes to the shepherds because of God's providential plan for our life. It's God's plan. You were chosen to be a part of God's plan. Shout it out. Secondly, it tells us God always pursues us. He pursues shepherds and blessed them. Came to them out of nowhere because God knows how to choose those that need him. I don't know why, but he loves us. And then the third point is these shepherds had enough sense to say, which I'm telling you, you got to do today. Please hear me. Somebody, God had you tune in just to hear this. Your proclamation, what are you saying out of your mouth? What are you saying in church but then saying something else at home? What are you, what are the thoughts do you let go through your mind that kill the thoughts of God? What kind of actions are you doing that's sabotaging your own deliverance? Why do you walk around when you have control through the peace of God in your mind, letting all kind of wayward thoughts lead your life when God said, you ought to do what these shepherds did? You know what they did? They said, let's go see this blessing. You know what they said? Let's test this thing out. They went. Many of you, listen to me. You don't have to test it out. You already have a testimony. God has blessed you. And if God blessed you and gave you a peace in the past, why are you walking around now not seeing the blessing God has given? This Christmas peace, this peace that came with redemptive power is a part of your life. And then finally, the shepherds, when he got there, they saw Mary and the baby. And the Bible says, they went around and start telling everybody what the angel said to them. If you want a real blessing in your life, start saying what God said to you. Start talking who God said you are. Walk around your house right now. Go out of your door. When you get in your car and a negative thought comes, start speaking the words God says who you are. Start letting the devil know. Let somebody know that God has control of my life. We are spirit, soul, and body. We have spiritual warfare. But we got weapons, and that main weapons, when the angels showed up to announce the birth of Christ, they said, peace on earth and goodwill or favor to those whom God has chosen. Power. Power in your life right now. You don't have to go through this season. I know you're missing people. I know there's trouble. But the power in your life right now is the power of that Christmas peace. Those angels, that redemptive, regenerating, salvation peace. And since you're under it, God said, you're resting in his favor. Where's the peace, Pastor? I'm done. The peace is in God's providential plan for your life. It's his plan, not yours. Quit worrying. The peace is in God's pursuit. He'll always pursue you to give you provisions. He's going to provide. And finally, it's in your own proclamation and progress. God bless you. This is Pastor Duncan's. Um, I hope you've been blessed by this word. Share this with somebody. This is a tough time in our lives right now. But there is a peace that comes at Christmas that we love to run around singing Christmas songs. But that peace can go with you all year long if you continue to trust God. God bless you. Take it to him and leave it there. I was down but with no way up and I needed some help. Everybody Breathing but not living, just existing Well, and I needed some help Somebody
Somebody told me that Jesus will set you free. 